Forgive us if we gossip away with each other. We, we did a podcast together after Jaipur that was meant to last one hour and went on for three and a half, I think, in the end, provided almost a whole season. Um, it's my huge, huge pleasure to introduce Karen Elkins, who is that rarest, that unicorn uh, in the forest, uh, a, 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 an academic at the top of her trade who can also write books that do spectacularly well uh, uh, for general readers. Uh, and she has, is a highly respected historian, both in the, in the ivory towers and in the general populace, which is an amazingly rare uh, Venn diagrams that, uh, that cross uh, amazingly uh, infrequently. Um, her own story of her research and her dogged persistence in search of the truth uh, is apparently going to be made into a movie, in fact. It's going to be a... Uh, it's so an extraordinary a story that uh, Hollywood has bought the rights to it. Um, in her first uh, great book, which won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, on the Mau Mau and the British, um, the harsh British uh, measures of torture and mass uh, internment, uh, which they used to suppress this uh, imperial uprising, particularly by the Kokoyu tribe. Um, Caroline, unable to find documents uh, relating to it, official documents, relied quite heavily on oral testimonies, which was then criticized by many people uh, afterwards. And in the event, Caroline pursued this, stuck to her guns, and it turned out that there were um, no less than 240,000 files that the Foreign Office had had all along uh, and which they had hidden deliberately out of reach of historians, which proved everything that she had gathered in her oral work, uh, which uh, were, she managed to access uh, to prove her case uh, and win a trial that eventually brought financial um, relief to some of the victims, uh, an apology from the British government, and a monument to the victims. Uh, it's a very, very rare case uh, of a historian pursuing, <laughs> she deserves every bit of that clapping, pursuing um, their work in the face of um, extreme threats and uh, a long period of her life suffering anxiety and uh, uh, legal threats and so on. Um, and the result has been from those files, a second book called The Legacy of Violence, which is what she'll be mainly talking about today, though I will certainly question her on the first book uh, afterwards, um, and which shows that the methods used to suppress Mau Mau were not um, the result of a few bad eggs uh, or rotten apples uh, in the barrow, that there were, um, in fact, a systematic policy used by the British Empire to suppress insurrections ranging from uh, Palestine through Iraq uh, and through Malaya and Cyprus and many other cases. So in this second book, a much wider canvas uh, is taken on, and it is a remarkable feat of sto uh, storytelling, which has also won uh, every imaginable prize uh, and, uh, uh, and, been, and received a series of uh, extraordinary reviews. So what we propose to do is to let Caroline tell her story for half an hour. Um, I'll then chat a bit and then open it up to you guys uh, for further questions. So go to it, Caroline. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, William, for those generous words and, and just for having me here. Um, and, and everybody at, 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 uh, at Teamworks and the rest, it's, it's an extraordinary event to pull off. And I think as an author to see all of you to take your time on a beautiful Saturday um, to talk ideas. It's, it just, it's just extraordinary. And so thank you for creating this opportunity. Um, now, what I'd like to do, can I get these slides up here? Yes? Perfect. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is, is talk to you a little bit about the, which William sort of touched on, the, the inspiration for this book. Um, and it comes from 
Imperial Reckoning. And as, as William was just saying, that book was, uh, it was really a book of an act of historical reconstruction of these detention camps and these emergency villages that took place during the 1950s, during this, this moment called the Mau Mau Emergency. Um, and the book itself was intended really to do one thing. It was to s establish as fact that this happened. To bear witness, using historical evidence, that systematized violence was enacted, including forced labor, torture, murder, as well as official cover-up. Legalized that, lawlessness. Yes, yes, that, we're going to come to that. that you know, I, that, that, that hit me. I, we'll talk about the inspiration for that one, too. But, you know, that this official cover-up then, which, which William was gesturing to, went all the way up to the Prime Minister. Winston Churchill, then, uh, then it goes on to, uh, to, to Macmillan. And, you know, of course, all good purchases, as, as William was just gesturing to, it was clear that there were massive amounts of, of files missing. And so, as I said, it's, it's this act of historical reconstruction, trying to put this back together again, trawling through the archives in London and Nairobi, trying to find any bits and pieces, and then, of course, hundreds of oral testimonies. So it's a bit like a mosaic that you put together. While the picture of the mosaic is incomplete, it's, it, is, it is vibrant enough, clear enough in, in what it's telling you for, to, 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 make, to draw various conclusions. But um, there are many unanswered questions in this book. As I said, it had its limitations. It was a book that was meant to bear witness. And trying to understand why this was happening, the how and why this kind of violence was taking place. And at the same time, and I'll sort of give us a sense of the map here, you know, it was said at the time um, by historians and certainly by politicians and some in the media that Kenya was an exceptional case, right, to an otherwise exceptional British Empire. <laughs> that um, exceptional not only because of its size and scope, this just gives you a sense, right, to orient ourselves. I love maps, they orient us, right? You know, where, you know, 25% of the world's land mass, give or take, approximately 700 million subjects, um, it's the largest empire the world has ever known. Um, but it's also considered exceptional by some because of its liberal imperialism which is based upon um, this notion, of course, liberalism being taken to empire with its ideas of reform. And it's in com common parlance, often known as a civilizing mission, with you know, sort of this idea that Britain's colonial ideology was to transform these so-called native populations into modern citizens. And Britain, of course, did this with the minimum, the exceptionalism, the minimum use of force, and instead, benevolent policies, education, health care, infrastructure, all these things. And it made Britain different from all other European colonizers, particularly the wretched French, the bete noire of all things British. OK. But I had my doubts, right? And to give you a sense, I knew from my own work that on Kenya, that in the archives, I saw these different figures sort of coming into Kenya and then going out of Kenya, and we knew at the time, again, to give you a sense, here's our map, um, if we take, many of them are coming from the UK, after World War II, the first major state of emergency, right, and there are over 30 in the post-war period, is in Palestine, and then we go on to Malaya, then to Kenya, then to Cyprus, these are the big ones, Aden, Northern Ireland, and then, of course, at Malaya, there's another one where the British are actually going and sending personnel to Washington where they're advising various administrations on counterinsurgency. And that's why Strategic Hamlet, for example, in Vietnam looks very similar to what's going on in Malaya and Kenya. Okay. So what I intended to do when I got all finished was to write a book about this. Post-World War II, how all of this is going on. But, as things happen, um, something intervenes along the way. And it, as I'm starting out on this project, um, five elderly Kikuyu claimants from Kenya's Central Highlands um, sue Her Majesty's government, filing in 2009, um, for systematized violence committed in Kenya's detention camps and emergency villages. And they file a suit in London's High Court it's the Foreign and Commonwealth Office that is the name defendant. And they're using my book as the evidentiary basis for the case. 
and we can talk about the q and I end up becoming expert witness for the claimants. Um, and I always like to think at the time, I was like, oh, I watch, I, I love law programs. I watch lots of law and order. I know what to do. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, and in the course of the case, about partway through, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office makes a stunning announcement in court, which rarely happens. It happens in law and order, but it doesn't happen in real life. When they call this emergency hearing in the Foreign and Common in the in the in the High Court, and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office discloses that they've just discovered 300 boxes of previously undisclosed files hidden in the fourth floor subterranean in Hanslope Park. Yes. Well, we, you know, we knew, we had a real sense that I certainly did in the first book. You know, you could tell just by do, excavating the archives. Entire departments were gone. The police department, gone. Ministry of Internal Security and Defense, gone. Like, there's just nothing. Um, and we kept asking one of the great, you know, one of the many important elements of this particular case is we had now the power of the court behind us demanding from the government files. My experience with this case is to know, without that, you're not getting them. <laughs> and even with it, you're only going to get part of them. And so we kept asking, kept asking, kept asking. Finally, there is actually so a... The Foreign Office was in danger of itself being contempt of court. Precisely. Yeah. And you know, William, that is an enormously important question. The $64,000 question is, why didn't they get rid of these bio boxes? Right. They've been, they, they were packed up and spirited away at the time of decolonization. They also found next to them, which is going to be important for our, this, this book, um, 8,800 files similarly packed up and spirited away at the time of decolonization um, and brought back to, uh, back to the UK, held under lock and key. And so the question becomes, why disclose? There's a lot of back and forth. The claimant's attorneys at Lee Day felt very strongly that the legal representation for the Foreign and Commonwealth Office strenuously, most likely we don't know this, urged them, you've got to disclose these folks. Because if you get caught with this, everybody is professionally in, in really deep water. So it was two years, though, two years into the case. It took them two so years. Interesting. So these guys would not be personally liable if they produced evidence showing torture, killings, and so on. But if they hid it, they could lose their jobs. They can lose their jobs. Yeah. So they are defending the colonial office of yesteryear. So there's a political issue, but for those on the ground, David Chaplin, who is the head of legal uh, mind in the, in, the, in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the QCs, Robert Jay, and the, uh, and the great guy Mansfield. I mean, these are towering figures in the UK. Right? And so they disclose. And we can sort of chat about that. We can have, we, which we did, we had lots and lots of fun talking about this uh, recently. But for the purposes of this current book that I'm trying to work on, meanwhile, um, and it becomes clear to me, and I begin excavating, that what happens is the British government uploads onto a searchable, searchable database um, the files that are found and that they deem to be relevant to the case. So the defendant actually had the right in this instance to deem what was relevant in the case. Anyway, I had a team of Harvard graduate students working with me. We excavate them. Um, it becomes clear there's something called Operation Legacy. And the extent of the document destruction is enormous that we find out. So we get a little bit of it, but what we come to determine, for the very first time in really the history of studying empire, did we have the documents documenting the document destruction? And in the Kenyan case, I estimate about three and a half tons of files had been burned or dumped into the Indian Ocean at the time of decolonization. That's a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence. So I'm trying to write a big book now about the end of the British Empire and violence. And if this is the case in Kenya, one can reasonably surmise this is going on in other locations. So, so what do you do, right? Well, the first thing you start doing is you start thinking laterally. Like, now we're gonna, I want to talk to you a little bit about evidence and how do I sort of get at this how and why question we see this violence playing out. Well, one of the first things that you do is you expand your evidentiary toolkit widely. So I'm in 13, you know, 14 different locations. These are sort of some of the main ones. 
private archives, in particular the Haganah Archive in Tel Aviv, the Yoka Archive in, in, in Cyprus, fabulous oral records collections in Singapore. My children have seen the world. They dreaded every minute of being dragged into the archives and now things, it's, think it's kind of cool that they got to do this. So they're 21 and 23, so they, there's a new, there's a new uh, definition of coolness. But the other thing that you do is you move your time frame. This book, which you can see is rather weighty, um, was supposed to be just about the era after the Second World War, maybe the introductory chapter about the pre-World War II period. Instead, about half the book now is about the pre-World War II period. And in fact, probably the, one of the most important things I did, and we're gonna come to this in a little bit, the most important things that I did was to move that time frame. And what's clear to me now is that the, that, that sort of World War II line, which we draw as, it may seem very self-evident to some of you sitting in the audience, but that we as historians really sort of had a sort of this kind of hard, hard and fast rule. There's pre-World War II, there's after World War II. Okay. So what did I find? Well, <clears throat> in some ways, legacy of violence, the history of the British Empire, the title's a little bit of a giveaway, um, but what I'm particularly interested in this book is I'm interested in the interplay between liberalism, the law, violence, and historical claim making. And the ways in which state-directed violence in the empire, and I want to focus on that state-directed violence, shape, have shaped lar large parts of our contemporary world. And so I, wh whilst not unimportant in the lived experience of empire, I'm not, I'm not looking at sort of day-to-day -day violence in, in private spaces. I'm not looking at casual violence. I'm looking at the role of the state, right? I wanna know what the state was doing to its colonized populations. And in particular, what I'm interested in is, I'm interested in sort of 19th and 20th century. After, sort of what we know is the sort of the second, the, the Britain's second empire. And so, particularly in places where there are non-white subjects, right? Southeast Asia, Middle East, and Africa. So let's unpack these a little bit. I've got, what, about 15 minutes to do that with you. So liberalism and law, it's, it's, I, you know, sweeping things, I, that's my thing, right? I don't say, you know, so um, law, violence, and claim making. Um, and, you know, so let's start with, with liberalism. Well, in the empire, it's called liberal imperialism. And beginning in the, the 19th century, it was framed around ideas of developmentalism, as you've written in, in, in your work, right? And the so-called natives of empire were likened to, quote unquote, often you see the term children. And like children, they were malleable. And with proper British tutelage, and they could be rendered into rational adults, respectful of law and order, prepared to take on the rights and responsibilities of the modern world. And the civilizing mission, as I mentioned before, that's what this, there's, you know, we sort of switch terms, liberal imperialism, civilizing mission, they're all sort of all sort of terms for the same thing. Would, of course, take decades, maybe even centuries in some places to carry out. And in the meantime, as I'm sure you've heard before, Britain would shoulder this responsibility. This burden, the famous term, you guys tell me, Rudyard Kipling, it is called the white man's burden. Exactly. But, and I'll sort of read a little bit from the book itself, but this is part of our story. If Britain's civilizing mission was reformist in its claims, it was brutal nonetheless. And violence was not just the British Empire's midwife, it was endemic to the structures and systems of British rule. It was not just an occasional means to liberal, imperialism, liberal imperialism's end, it was a means and end for as long as the British Empire remained alive. And without it, Britain could not have maintained its sovereign claims to the colonies. Indeed, how could it be otherwise? Much as Hobbes has suggested, and sociologist Max Weber explained in Politics as a Vocation, that a monopoly of the means of legitimate violence is a necessary condition to a state's existence, right? So the British state is laying claim to legitimate violence. Everything else, so if you decide you're going to protest against labor, if you're going to rebel against the, the claims that British is, Britain is making about your sovereignty, that's illegitimate violence. And the state is going to come down on you, right? And you know, when we see this, any time there is an existential threat to the state, they're going to deploy what is legally enabled violence, something I'm gonna come back to. But importantly for our story, 
Violence was intimately connected to this civilizing mission, this developmentalism, right? In other words, violence had what British officials called the moral effect. I'm always looking for language. And this moral effect of violence, that's how it's described in the 19th century, all the way through, into the, well into the 20th century. And it's kind of a perversion, a biblical perversion, right? A Proverbs 13, 24, spare the rod, spoil the child. And this term, as I said, continues on well into the 20th century. Now, the law. If we go back to the Mau Mau case, what's so striking about this case is how many times the Foreign and Commonwealth Office are going to argue that what these British colonial officials did was lawful. There are laws allowing for this. So how could we possibly, some 50 years after events, find that these individuals had not only broken the law, but had committed these horrible crimes. Well, the rule of law, if you will, is absolutely sacrosanct in the, in, in, in the British Empire. It is the cornerstone for, for good governance. And again, I'd like to sort of, because you gestured to it a moment ago, it, it's something that, sort of a term that I use throughout the book. And I say that time and again, throughout the, the 19th and 20th centuries, Ordinary codes and regulations proved insufficient in quelling empire's rebellions and, and Britain's spectral fears. So colonial officials turned to legal exceptionalism in the form of martial law and states of emergency or statutory martial law. And while lawful, these states of exception granted extraordinary power to the military and to the government's executive branch. And decision making was left to men on the spot and their discretionary authority was staggering. They interpreted when violence was necessary, at what intensity level, to protect, to, to protect the state and preserve its laws. And when security forces needed more discretion, or when their actions constituted unsanctioned violence, in other words, when, when what they were doing was illegal, there weren't any laws for it, the state often rendered this lawless behavior legal by amending old regulations and creating new ones. Right? So this tautological process of law creation, of incrementally legalizing, bureaucratizing, legitimating state-directed violence when ordinary laws proved insufficient for maintaining order and control is something that I call in this book legalized lawlessness. That what you're doing is lawless, but there's ways in which we can create new laws to render it legal, this kind of tautological process. So I'll give you an example. Let's stick to the Kenyan case. In the case of Kenya, there's something called um, the dilution technique, which is systematized violence. It's practiced in uh, beginning in 1957. And what they did is they took small batches of detainees out of sort of large holding camps and brought them to smaller detention camps. And frankly, legal, we're, we're just beating them mercilessly, manhandling them, torturing them until they cooperated. And then they moved them on to another camp. Now, of course, you, can't do, you couldn't do this at the time. So what do you do? Well, if you're the attorney general in Kenya, you write to the colonial secretary, Alan Lennox Boyd, and say, Boyd, and say we have a problem. Because at the time, you, know, you sort of think that all this is going on, but everything, getting back to this, the sacrosanct nature of the rule of law. At the time, they had to make sure that this was legal, that these colonial officers could not be uh, tried for anything. And they create new laws something called compelling force, punitive force. So it gives you a sense, ex post facto, the fa post facto, they create this, and then of course they can go on their way of beating the, the detainees because there are laws protecting them. Okay, so let's turn to the violence. What's clear is that the colonial violence in all these different colonies, beginning in the 19th and the 20th century, are not a series of one-offs. Rather, it's systematized, and as we move within and between colonies, what really stri was striking to me was the degree to which all these things and these practices and even these individuals are, are similar. So, for example, we see in India in the 19th century, refugee camps. We see the creation of the Adamant Island prison. We move to South Africa. We see the creation of concentration camps there. And I can sort of keep going on and on with you, right? And 
at the same time, we also see the same legitimating language. Just to clarify, concentration camps being the first, the British term that first used in the Boer War. Absolutely. At the, to thank you for that, William. At the start of the 20th century, between 1899 and 1902, Britain is fighting the Boer War, South African War. As part of that, it is the first time that concentration camps are used and targeted entirely at one particular ethnic population, in this case, the Afrikaners. In addition, there were Africans who were also detained. Under Kitchener, they're leveling scorched earth policies, the whole range of things that are taking place in South Africa that then are dispersed to the empire. And we go one after another after another. I'm going to sort of show you an example of this in a moment. And of course, as we move along, the moral effect of violence, particularly after World War II and all the international accords, the UN Declaration on Human Rights, but most importantly, the European Convention on Human Rights, no longer is it called the moral effect of violence. We call it hearts and minds campaigns with rehabilitation. So this then brings me to the point about historical claim making. Now, oftentimes, it is not only is it British exceptionalism, but many studying this in sort of our world of historians said, Britain never had a model. There was no model for counterinsurgency. Show me the document. I always love that one. Show me the document. Well, the documents are all gone. But so I had to write a 900-page book in the absence of the documents. But what this became, this book, became this massive mapping exercise trying to figure out who's going where and what are they bringing with them. So let me give you an example. Getting back to my point about moving this time horizon back. Let's move us to Palestine in the 1930s. And between 1936 and 1939, there is something called the Arab Revolt. And I'll be quite reductive about it. The Arab population is rising up against Britain. Britain is a mandatory, it's a, it's a League of Nations mandate. Britain is the mandatory power. You sort of have a triangulated... Uh, because of immigration of Jewish, Jewish people coming yes, into precisely, Palestine. Precisely. What had been a 10% a Jewish population in 1917 yes. grows to be a 60%, 70%. Precisely. And, precisely. and there's influxes in the Jewish population. There's also, for a very long period of time, you know, Arabs and Jewish population lived quite peacefully <laughs> prior to the Brits showing up. And sort of different forms of divide and rule policies unfold. And the important part is, is that at this point in the late 1930s, is probably about 20% of this book is about Palestine. It's so important to our understanding of what happens afterward. And so how do you begin to figure out what happens? Well, you begin to figure out what happens there in terms of the larger sort of spider's web. And I sort of liken all of this to a spider's web, right? It's, it's, you know, when you see a spider web right up close, you don't really get a sense of the intricacy of, 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 of the silk. But when you step back, so let's step back for a second. So here we have up here our friend Charles Taggart. You may have run into him, William, in some of your... He was... So these are all peripatetic figures of the empire. And the whole book is about this. This book is like, you know, I'm going to go, go buy, a, buy a copy. It's about... I'm telling you and not... I'm, I'm showing you and not telling you through these different historical actors, right? So Taggart is known as the Man of Iron. He miraculously survives multiple, I think, eight or nine assassination attempts in Bengal. But he starts, he's Irish, he starts in Ireland. He goes to Bengal, where he's head of the police force, the criminal investigation department. He then is brought back to Ireland to help during the Irish uh, War of Independence in the 19, early 1920s. He goes to the UK to advise the government. He then goes back to Bengal, where he, again, narrowly this time, it was the last time there was a bomb that was thrown at his feet. He escapes that one. He's on his eighth of nine lives. He then goes back to the UK, where they say, wait a minute, we need you in Palestine. It's a mess. Will you go? He goes to Palestine. Okay. And he's there to advise. The next guy is this guy on the bottom left, David Petrie. David Petrie is the head of intelligence for in India extremely important role. He's developing a whole range of systems within this, and he eventually becomes the director of MI5. But he and Taggart work together closely. As Taggart says, he calls Petrie his yin, the yin to his yang, and he goes to Palestine. Up here, we have Henry Tudor. Now, I love Henry Tudor. Henry Tudor is one of Winston Churchill's very best friends. They come of age together in the Northwest frontier in India. He then goes to South Africa in the South African War, which we just discussed. 
He goes back to India, again, up in the northwest frontier. See, these are terrific audio visuals. I'm loving oh. this. How do you get these things moving? <laughs> <laughs> it's called tech support. That's why you have children. <laughs> they felt very invested in this. I want this. this. Uh, Egypt in the 1920s. He then goes to Ireland. Uh, pardon me. He then goes to the UK, over to Ireland. It's in Ireland where he, again, Churchill calls him in. He is in charge of the black and tans and the auxiliaries in Ireland. He, come, he becomes the, um, the IRA is known for chasing people throughout the empire um, to assassinate them. He, they, have a, they have a hit list. Number one on the hit list is Field Marshal Henry Tudor, who had been uh, also in charge in Ireland. This guy, uh, Bob, uh, pardon me, um, uh, his, I'm trying to think, the, uh, what was his name? Oh, it'll come back to me. Anyway, the number one on the list is literally being assassinated on the, his, his doorstep in Belgravia when Tudor gets into the train in Victoria Station to push off to Palestine. And waiting for him in his carriage is a note from the IRA, all caps. It reads, your days are numbered. Do not, these are all caps, do not think by leaving the country you will escape the hand of justice. Your death warrant is signed. Love you, mean it. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> IRA. So he's getting into the car as now the number one man. He gets to Palestine. The IRA actually eventually chases him down. He goes to pension off in Canada, where many actually of the IRA people on the IRA list um, are sent into the tundra, where they um, manage to survive. And then our last but not, we've got two more, Arthur Harris. Arthur Harris um, comes of age in, in uh, the empire. Sorry, this is actually Mozambique. It should be southern Rhodesia. He is quite famous. He's an RAF fly, fly, uh, fighter pilot. Bomber Harris. Bomber Harris. So this is before Bomber gets his name uh, later on. He then, he's very upset that he misses some of the war. So he actually goes to southwest. Uh, he goes down to southern Rhodesia. He then goes to southwest Africa. Um, during the, uh, the uh, First World War, he comes back to the UK to fight, um, and then he eventually goes to India, where he's bombing in the Northwest Frontier. He goes to Iraq, where he's known for, he really pioneers weapons testing in Iraq, in Mesopotamia. Um, dropping poison gas. Dropping on poison gas all over. Winston Churchill at that point is Minister for uh, Air and Defense, uh, war and de uh, yes, Air and Defense, and then he goes back to the UK and now into Palestine. And last but not least, you guys probably know this guy, Monty. Everybody knows Monty, right? Monty himself is Irish. He, where is Monty? There we go. And we're just going to get him into Palestine so we can move ourselves along. Um, but it gives you a sense of the, and I should say, last but not least, these guys, and he goes off to India. He goes into Palestine. What I should point out, so there they all are. So going back to there was no model. These guys are moving their practices, their ideas, and most importantly, what's moving here is the law. Prior to Palestine, we've been using mar mar martial law had been what had been enabling these states of emergency. But in fact, what happens is, is the military is screaming bloody murder because what happens is when martial law is lifted, ordinary courts come back into place that individual soldiers could be tried for any crimes that they had committed that would have been an offense under ordinary civil procedure. So they introduced for the first time what is called statutory martial law. It too is perfected in 1936 in Palestine. It is what is the legal basis for what we now know as a state of emergency or a police state. So, what to say in conclusion. And also point out they all go back to the UK, by the way, um, and all of, these, all of these elements are deployed during the Second World War. Um, there are torture chambers that, uh, anybody been to uh, Kensington Palace before? Raise your hand, yeah. You know those posh, those posh houses behind Kensington Palace, um, you know, which are now the, yeah, you've got to be a billionaire in order to live there. Those were where the secret torture chambers were kept um, during the Second World War. Um, so, what can we say in conclusion? Just a couple things. You know, I think the, and I'm going to ra uh, wrap this up, but it, it becomes all of these laws, first of all, all of these nations are born out of cauldrons of violence. There's no question. And at the same time, 
the British government in this sort of exceptional, it, it lives in a perpetual state of exception. The European Convention on Human Rights signed in 51, extended the empire in 53. Britain derogated 30 times more, more than the combined total of the other 45 members of the Council of Europe in the first 60 years of the convention's application. This is how they're getting away with this. And importantly, the myth goes on. The Home Office Guide for the UK Citizenship Test, if you want to become a citizen of the UK and you get your little pamphlet, it says this. There was, for the most part, an orderly transition from empire to commonwealth with countries being granted their independence. <laughs> and I'll end there. Thank you. So, Karen, looking at this down the far end of the telescope, look at trying to assess all this from a distance now. Where, do you, where does this leave the British Empire in relation, say, to the Belgians in the Congo, or Stalin with um, liquidating th people in the, uh, in the disappearances of the 30s? Um, you write somewhere in the book, the British Empire and totalitarian, totalitarian regimes were not the same yeah. thing, but from what you've shown, there's not much difference also mm. when it comes to the point of it. Yeah. Torture chambers existed, mm -hmm. torture was there, assassination is there, um, long-term internments, uh, the, the, there is no, uh, the, the officials can get away with doing really what they want. Mm -hmm. Where would you assess the British in comparison to all these other regimes that we've been brought up mm -hmm. to think of mm -hmm. as, as, as often inherently evil? Yeah, I think the, you know, I often, I, it's, a, it's such an important question, William, and I think the, I want to go really get to this question of what makes this British liberal imperialism, a liberal empire, different from, say, a fascist empire. And at the time during the war, particularly, the black radicals coming from the, the Caribbean diaspora, folks like George Padmore, were hammering home about fascist imperialism, um, about British fascist, and not unlike what we're hearing today in some ways, right? And I think one of the arguments that I'm making is this, which is what we see is violence adhering to liberalism. Liberal imperialism is an oxymoron. And the coercion and the reform are Imperialism by its nature means something illiberal. You're, right, you're exactly. oppressing your rule right. on someone else. Right. And so when we think about the liberal imperialism, what happens is that coercion and reform become two sides of the same coin, right? And so, for example, this developmentalism, it's not only is it within Britain's sort of orthodoxy around empire, it's encoded in international treaties. So, that's League of Nations mandates. These mandates are for those populations not yet, important, language is important, not yet ready to stand on their own. UN charter, non-self-governing territories for populations not yet ready to stand on their own, this developmentalism. Violence is often, while the moral effect is not used, the notion that somehow or another violence is going to bring about a kind of developmentalism, of black and brown populations in particular. And of course, the not yet, when does the not yet come? Never. We're still waiting for the yet. And so when we get to the comparison to say, the, let's pick the German Empire in, in World War II and, and the Eastern Front, there was nothing reformist about these fascist regimes, right? Empire was something unto itself, in and of itself. It was never supposed to end. It was about, it was about uh, white domination. There was no developmentalism. It was something unto itself. At some point in the future, even if it was decades, centuries beyond, the British Empire was supposed to devolve. And so what we see after World War II is there's a, it's, a, it's sort of this collision, right? And it's also what makes the, the charges of violence so difficult to make stick. Pretty easy to make it stick on a fascist regime when you really are sort of eliminationist, you don't see any sort of points of developmentalism, whereas on this one, every time they're charged with something, so take post-World War II. Prior to World War II, it's all about trusteeship. How ridiculously paternalistic is that, right? That they are in holding in trust these populations of the world. And then they decide... Literally putting into legal language the idea of, of, of a child 
Uh, or, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, exactly. It's a, a, a ward looking exactly. after a... Right, right. Yeah. So there's all kinds of convention going on. Um, and by the way, remember, this transcends political party, right? It's the Attlee government, labor post-World War II. Labor, who is leveling some of, the, some of the most atrocious policies, first in Palestine and then in Malaya. And they say, wait a minute, wait a minute, can't use trusteeship anymore, let's call it partnership. So they call it partnership. And of course, there's a junior partner and a senior partner in all of this. Like the moral effect, the moral effect doesn't work anymore. Not, not, it's not, so it becomes rehabilitation. And occasionally, you know, and there are ways in which they're able con to consistently explain away anything that happens in empire as a tragic one-off. Look at what we're doing. We're civilizing the world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, legacy of violence. What is the legacy of the legacy of violence? <laughs> you talked about um, the British in, Mal in, Mal in Malaya teaching counterinsurgency techniques to the, the U.S. In, in Vietnam. We've seen the same legal statutes used in Palestine to be used now in occupied Palestine by the Israelis, the same sort of uh, uh, ability to arrest and, 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 and hold without trial, go back to British precedents. Where do you see these laws still being used today? Mm -hmm. Modi's government, everything, every, you know, all that we see going on there. Um, I think, it, 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 frankly, it's de rigueur in many of these post-colonial nations, the, these laws, but I also think the, the notion of, perm of, of, what, of perm permissible norms, the notion that um, nations that are, and we obviously, 900 page book, not a lot of time to get into some of this, born of these cauldrons of violence where this violence is also an epiphenomena of these divide and rule policies, right? So you see populations after populations after populations. In the Kenyan case where you see there's absolutely white and black perpetrators of colonial crimes. Um, and yet it's the British government that says, okay, you're either with us or against us. If you don't arm yourself, become a member of the Home Guard, you're going to a detention camp. So to this day, the question becomes, and when I was doing my research in Kenya, and I was interviewing hundreds of, of, of detainees, getting back to sort of legacy, on the most local of levels, right? When Eleanor Roosevelt is writing about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and she's the, the chairwoman for this, right? And she says, actually, where human rights matter the most, William, is in small places close to home. So what happens, what's the legacy of this kind of violence taking place, intimate violence, detention camps, emergency villages, local villagers being co-opted into the colonial regime of security forces. And then in many instances, Kenya would be one, but it's not the only one, Malaya would be another example, Aden certainly example, where when decolonization happens, no one's allowed to talk about this, ever, ever. In part because... Who's, who's stopping them? Governments. In part because the post-colonial yeah, regimes... The government. Part of Britain's MO was to install post-colonial regimes that were favorable to the British government. And, and not only that, many of these post-colonial regimes were complicit in some of the violence that took place. So there's no benefit whatsoever to having this. And I, I, I'm making some very broad stroke generalizations right now. But getting back to you know, my own sort of... And again, sort of the impetus for some of this book when I was doing the interviews in the late 90s, the predominant number for the Kenya book, the number of times I would interview, and these were elderly people whose children and grandchildren had no idea they'd ever been detained, had no idea why their brother looked just like the next door neighbor's father, right? Why, I mean, this kind of intercommunal violence that had taken place, and obviously, when we think about the context of India, more is, frankly, known about that in, within the context of India than it was in some of these other locations. And so I think for us as, as historians, certainly, and we're not walking this journey alone, anthropologists, you know, uh, you know people writing novels, the rest, I think really, um, to me, I think some of this is providing the evidence, if you will, for, for different countries to come to terms with their own histories. And I think in that sense, um, I hope that this book is some contribution to that. Questions? We have 10 minutes. Sure. Right. His hand was up first. A very interesting talk you gave. But tell me one thing. While all these atrocities were going on, what was the role of the British press? They say it's a very independent thing. So Manchester Guardian or Times and so were they 
were they silent partners in crime or were they also ignorant? Yeah, the, the, the yes and no, right? The, the question was, if everybody heard, where was the press in this? Things like the Manchester Guardian, the Observer, and others. Um, on the one hand, many of them increasingly, what, what is so striking is how much was known at the time. And the way in which the reception at home, a, question, a combination of um, bellicose imperialists, uh, complacency was its own scourge, disavow. Remember, Britons are, are uh, rationing still, right, right through the, the, the mid-1950s. And the press was reporting a, a great deal of things, but a few things. One, there was all kinds of censorship that was taking place in these various locations. And so the press was there at the will of either the British High Com or the governor. And there was many cases, I mean, you know, there was a the case in, take Palestine, we'll go back to the example that I showed, you know, uh, Churchill just rounded them all up along uh, and tossed them out of Palestine. Out, out you go, you know, unless you, if you were printing things. The other thing was the BBC at the time had a two-step verification rule. So you had to, it was not, they had the amount of basically sourcing they had to do. And what so often happened is that people would write, for example, in the case I mentioned uh, sort of detaining letters and, and, and Wayne did as well. Well, these were smuggled out of the camp, often signed anonymously. And then they would say, well, these anonymous letters are no good because you can't, you can't cross-reference them, right? You can't verify this. And then, of course, there were times when, you know, certainly in the Kenyan case, we see this in Malaya and elsewhere, where the editors would go to the colonial office and say, look, we've got this evidence, to the colonial, to the, to the colonial secretary. And there would be a deal worked out. So there was, it, it's, it's, on the one hand, they were incredibly important. They're incredibly important for me as a historian in connecting the dots. On the other hand, there's, even for the left press, um, there are questions. Questions about if we go to Malaya, it was a communist insurgency. How much are you going to report? And here's that, I'll make this last point. It was never good for the press to single out the British military and call them out for crimes in the empire. And in fact, there were several, Barbara Castle will be an example of an MP who was sent out to the empire and she wrote a couple different pieces, both in Kenya and Malaya. And in the Malayan case, she did call out the security forces and she was dressed up by Hugh Gatskill and others within uh, the Labour Party. And you know, that took her out. She was the rising star in the Labour Party. She'd never had a serious cabinet position. One, she had one, a very minor cabinet position and took her out. So people were very, very careful about it. But I think my biggest headline too is how much, what is striking is how much was actually known at the time and how, how Britons digested this and processed this. And there's this constant working and reworking of this liberal project, but the state was believed by many people. These are one-offs, look at what we're doing. Terrible, horrible things in the empire. Bad apples. Bad apples. And we're saving civilization from fill in the blank, savage Mau Mau, terrible communists, you know, awful, those people in Northern Ireland who, who are assassinating our men, um, you know, these sorts of things. Um, yes, over here. here. Okay. Uh, you were talking about the relationship between uh, fascism and imperialism, and asking a, a contemporary question, uh, in the United States now, you know, we have a strong fascist movement, but strangely, it's not the imperialists, mainly, the imperialists, or the neocons, as they were called, have all retreated sort of to the Democratic Party. I'm thinking like Liz Cheney, uh, John Bolton. These are the big time imperialists, uh, but they're not associated with the fascist movement, which is very xenophobic, but kind of isolationist. Not, in fact, strangely, the Trump regime was one of the more peaceful regimes in terms of international intervention of say the last 50 years or 60 years. So are we embarked on a new, and this is unusual because usually fascist regimes are the sort of vanguard of the imperialist uh, uh, movement of whatever country they represent. So are we in a new post-colonial uh, uh, time now where fascism and imperialism are no longer uh, overlapping? Uh, what's happening? Well, 
It's a big, big, big question, right? But I think my immediate response to that would be, yes, there's imperialism. I mean, uh, you know, look at the United, within the United States, if we think about liberalism, right, and the, and the nature of the colonial state, we look at sort of disenfranchised populations within the US. And under the Trump regime, we were horrendous, horrendous. So this kind of not yet, not yet, would describe the, ex the lived experience of our African-American population, would describe the police state that's being unleashed in Portland, Oregon, and George Floyd, and, you know, and I think the bottom line is, you know, the question, my point about sort of the not yet coming, and I really do believe this, that violence, and this is, this is my own critique of liberalism, that it does adhere to the liberal project for non-dominant, for non-white populations. And the question, and Franz Fanon saw this as, as well, right? Fanon says, that liberalism doesn't work. And not only do you need violence to sort of upend and sort of liberate yourself from the colonial experience, but liberalism is not a project for us. We have to find something else. And of course, there are all kinds of uh, imaginations then, you know, different sort of different kinds of forms. But I think getting back to it, it's not surprising to me that the neocons go in with the, the liberals because the, you know, your Liz Cheney's of the world still believe in the rule of law. She still believes, she, you know, I'm not a Liz Cheney fan, but, but she does, you know, at the end of the day, the Trump administration did not believe in the rule of law. And so the question, because, anyway, well, I, I will take some others, I'm happy to chat with you after this, but I think, the, I think there is a difference between them, and I think that the, I think it becomes very, I think it's dangerous for us to dismiss what we see as sort of fascism when it's not fascism. It's coming out of the liberal project, and I think our question needs to be, why is that? Interesting question. The gentleman here. Yeah. Dr. Elkins, thank you for your work. This is great. It's, it's amazing to see this work. Uh, my name is Dr. Kinoti. My grandfather was a Mau Mau. Uh, was, I grew up hearing the stories. He was captured in 1953, was incarcerated uh, in Earth River and all the stories you tell in the Imperial Lightning and suffered for almost 10 years, was released and it's very interesting that the governments that came after that really did not recognize the Mau Mau and went on to whitewash that history so that as I'm growing up in the 1970s, I'm hearing these stories from my grandfather about how he suffered and how many people suffered to try and uh, kick out the, the British and the colonialists and all the violence, but not a word in my school textbooks. Mm. There wasn't anything, so I go through all the way, do history, study history even in A levels, which is uh, high school, I never had a word of that. Mm. The Mau Mau were referred to as a ragtag army that was against the British and they did not really do much. Um, what you're talking about is revisionist history, which is really going back and digging up that and saying, how come we're not teaching this? And we're seeing that happening in the U.S. as well, where history is questioned and right now is not, I mean, there are states where this is becoming a real odd topic. Is there anything we've learned? I mean, from some of the work you've done and other historians have done, why is it that we are not willing to confront history? I would have loved to know this history, which is why when I saw your book when it came out in 2009, I was excited, I, you know, because I could learn something that exactly mirrored what my grandfather mm. was telling me happened to him as he grew up mm -hmm. in that system. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think the, just, just very briefly, and, and I think it, in some ways it comes back to, I, I certainly, first of all, thank you for all this, because it validates many ways what I was just sort of raising. And look, <laughs> Wars are fought over history. <laughs> um, censorship. You can argue very strongly that the current Ukraine conflict yeah, well, is a war exactly, exactly over conflict, over history. Precisely. Yeah. You know, um, the nature of getting back to the gentleman's first question about the role of the press and the way in which, you know, you know, the how it was dealt with at the time. And in fact, we were chatting beforehand, the, you know, about in the 1940s during the war, the Ministry of Information co-opted historians all at All Souls College at Oxford to sort of craft uh, 
a history of the empire that was then packaged and sold during the war, and they had everything, little roving vans and teacher packets and all the rest of it. It was, you know, it was mostly meant for the Americans, and the Americans didn't want to buy any books, but the, the Brits consumed them you know, rapaciously. And in Kenya, as you know, right? Right, Rais uh, Kenyatta, Napia uh, uh, Moy, Napia Kipaki, uh, you know, etc. You know, all these guys. It's not taught in the schools today because those in power have no. E even now. Even now. Even now. And so the you know, and, and even for my own self, you know, I'm sort of you know, you get as as many, by the way, as many of the the Mau Mau generals and others. I'm just a footnote in giving voice to them. It's it's their struggle. But we get appropriated not as the case may be. I never know when the alarms are going to go off at, at, at the, the visa counter or something that there's going to be a motorcade waiting for me. It just depends on who, what's happening. Um, and so, but I think it's, it's an important point and maybe, maybe one for us to really be reflecting on and also getting back to your project, William. You know, when, when I'm in Jaipur and I see these young school children, thousands of them, <laughs> thousands of them, I mean, first of all, as a writer, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like we're all Elvis or something. But so deeply interested in literature, so deeply interested in, in ideas, that gives me hope. And it's the younger generation. There's so many ways now that we can get ideas out. And I was sitting listening on different panels here. I just marvel at what's being done today. Marvel at it. And the ideas of my fellow speakers and authors that disseminate ideas, not just through traditional methods. And I learned this, this old dinosaur with her, my, you know, my kids are now 21 and 23, and they tick tock this and they do that, and I'm like, I don't tick and I don't talk. They're like, mom, you gotta, like, if you wanna get these ideas out. And so, but the point is, is that there's all these different ways of disseminating ideas outside of the state, right? And how do we think about a place like Kenya? Smartphone penetration is more than 50%, more than 50% in Kenya. Platforms like Equity and some others, and Equity, James Mwangi is, you know, his parents were Mau Mau, his father was killed in Mau Mau, um, he's a Kikuyu, he believes in all of this, ways in which we can circumvent the state, and, and it depends on us as historians to probably think outside the box. How do we link up with some of these folks? How do we leverage their platforms, new audiences, and so that would be sort of my, I mean, it's what's inspiring me right now to try to think about how can I, not to, I get back sounds far too, if you will, paternalistic, but how can I be part of a conversation and enable some of these ideas to get to young people? Thank you very much. A great question. We'll have one more. Okay. Everyone's well, gone quiet suddenly. At the front here, this gentleman here. Sorry, you, you've got, a, got the mic already, have you? Yeah. So we'll have two okay. questions, but I quick ones. I just want to ask, uh, to me, the, the, the ending of the British Empire, the way it happened last century, is actually quite good because to uh, dis disassemble an empire of that uh, 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 magnitude is, should take hundreds of years. And they, they realized after the Second World War that this is what they have to do in the next few decades. And with, with a lot, lot of problems and violence, it is still a somewhat of a miraculous uh, phenomenon in world history. That it After so all, quickly. it took four or five hundred years to apparently, take, apparently to take somewhere the Roman in the world Empire. Celebrates independence from Britain every six days. <laughs> it's the most popular festival in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that the more important thing, what Lloyd George who was the prime minister during the First World War, who in my book is a war criminal, did in Europe how they arranged the peace that basically get, get, uh, arranged for another world war. The way they, they had no I, and they had no idea about the world, you know, just like Wilson thought he was the uh, smartest person, uh, man in the world went over Europe, he had no idea, you know, about the world. So, Thank you, sir. Okay. We, got, we promised this guy in front the last word, so quickly, last. Yeah, um, in about 1959, 1960, I came across a manual in my father's library. My father caught me looking at it and made me read it. And it was a heavily 
illustrated book on the Mau Mau Rebellion. And uh, I wish I hadn't read it, but um, uh, it, it turned out to be a what looked like an instruction manual published by either the CIA or the US Army. A lot of illustrations. Um, and I got the impression at the time that it was a, a history of how the British got out of Kenya. That is, they weren't trying to justify uh, paternalism or the state or the laws. They were just trying to get the hell out. And I think the same thing, there was a, a turning point, same thing happened in India, where I don't know when exactly it happened, but they weren't interested anymore in staying in India, but they were trying to get the hell out. In a way, to me, it oldest, wouldn't be like what happened in Afghanistan, where it was just panic. They were trying to do it in an orderly manner, and that kind of justified some of the... There's quite an interesting comparison between the British leaving India and the French leaving Algeria. The British, since the time, because of the American Revolution, and because Cornwallis, who, who had to hand over and sign the peace uh, with, uh, with Washington, he's then recruited by the East India Company and goes to India. His first law that he makes when he arrives in India is that, the, that no British citizen should be allowed to settle in India because he identified the settler population mm -hmm. who had risen up against the British in America as the potential problem, not the Indians. They would, he thought, would take longer to get their stuff together. But he worried that if there was a settler or a mixed-race population. And so he legislates against them. As a result, no Brit can own land in India except a very, very small number of settlers working on indigo. Which meant that in 1947, while in the catastrophe of partition, while you have whatever it is, uh, 1.5 million people killed in the huge, largest migration and the horrors, horrors of, of partition, only six British people die in decolonization in India. And there'd always been this long-running fear since 1857 mm. that at some point everyone would turn on the Brits and they would be killed. Mm. But there's exactly, now, in comparison, the, the French in Algeria, who do settle and do have land, rather like the Brits do in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. In Kenya. And in Kenya. They fight for it, yeah. and, they then, and, and there it becomes bloody. And there it becomes, because when you've got a land to defend and it, you're farming land, that's when you take up arms. But yeah. the Brits get out in, in, in six months mm. in India. Mm. 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 Anyway, so many, many more. If you have got any money in your, in your accounts, go now and buy Legacy of Violence and, and Professor Elkin's other books. If you are a cheapskate and, and uh, not going to do that, at least download the brilliant performance on Empire Pod, uh, which, uh, which Caroline performs in her entire uh, Mau Mau. Uh, wonderful, wonderful story. So anyway, please a huge round of applause for the brilliant <laughs> Professor Elkins.